Good afternoon again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and to all of our listeners online. Um, I think a real pleasure to, to kick off session three, uh, looking at our, our South African gold operations, and, and I hope to share with you some of the, the passion we still have for these operations, uh, some of the real value that they've delivered over the years, and, and the value that they can still deliver over the years to come. Uh, so, so thank you very much. I think as with any any presentation of this nature, uh, forward-looking information is contained. There is a is a safe harbor, safe harbor statement, which I'll quickly take you through. Um, the information in this announcement may contain forward-looking statements with the meaning of, I'm joking, but if I could please request you to uh, to read this in your own time, uh, it does include some, some important information. Thank you. Okay, so, so moving on to our gold operations, um, you know, I think as, as many of us know, this was really where, where the company started. Uh, 2013, uh, from some of the less loved assets that were unbundled from gold fields and back then, as it was known, uh, Sabanya Gold. Um, you know, our first task as a management team was, was to take the, these assets and uh, enhance the sustainability of them. Uh, that was really achieved through, through an aggressive cost cutting uh, we were able to to cut about 25% of the total costs out of these operations. That increased our flexibility in terms of our mining operations, uh, increased our reserves, and therefore increased our life of mine. And it is really off these core assets that we've been able to build our business, uh, not only our gold business uh, through the acquisition of, of Vitz Gold, which included Burnstone, uh, the Cook operations, and, and more recently DRD, um, but also the rest of the business, which has pivoted into, into PGMs and, and more recently uh, battery and green metals. Um, so, so this really has been the, the solid foundation on which uh, Savanya Stillwater has been built. But I dare say these assets in their own right have delivered significant value. Uh, for anybody who, who was a shareholder at the unbundling or who invested in the company in those early years, um, I dare say you got back half of your value just in the first four years from dividends out of these assets alone. Uh, that excludes any of the significant capital appreciation and growth that you that you would have experienced as a shareholder. So, so substantial value from these assets. Uh, and over the coming slides, uh, I hope that we can, we, we can show you and, and share with you uh, that we still believe that there is significant value still to come from these assets uh, in the years to come. So, so a question we are often asked is, is why gold and how does it fit into our portfolio? And, and fundamentally, there are two parts to that. I think the, the first one is that gold is counter-cyclical. Uh, we know during, uh, during tough economic times with other metals battle, uh, gold thrives. And anybody who questioned the safe, uh, safe haven status of gold only needs to look back over the last 24 months uh, to see that it still fulfills that function. Uh, this gives us the opportunity to, to live our vision of delivering value to all stakeholders um, through through essentially having exposure during tough economic times to, to gold cycles, which tend to behave better. Uh, secondly, I think uh, we are fundamentally bullish on the on the long-term outlook of, of gold. There, there are some short-term headwinds uh, in terms of rising interest rates and uh, uh, tapering of stimulus packages. Uh, but fundamentally, the, uh, the unprecedented amount of lending and stimulus packages we've seen over the last decade inevitably will underpin gold as we see a more inflationary environment uh, and heading towards sustained low or even negative interest rates in, in the time to come. Uh, supply side, we see peaking in the next couple of years. There have not been any significant gold discoveries over the last few years. So fundamentally, the long-term outlook for gold remains very positive. If we, if we move on and uh, take a look at our, at, our, at our business as a whole, you know, I think as we, as we highlighted before, uh, we started our operations uh, back in 2012 with a total reserve base of, of 13 and a half million ounces. Um, you know, that was fundamentally underpinned by our three, three core assets, uh, being Clough, Griefontaine and Beatrix. And if we look at where we are today, uh, after nine years, having already mined over 10 million ounces of gold, uh, today our reserve base stands at 15.5 million ounces, so in fact higher uh, than when we, when we started back in 2012. A significant portion of those additional reserves have come from our three, co uh, three key, key assets, uh, but also a portion through, through the addition of, of the acquisitions we've made, uh, specifically including Burnstone, uh, which has recently been turned to account, as well as, uh, as DRD Gold. I think this, this is best displayed in the, in the graph here, which, which shows that uh, 
when Sabanya Gold, as it was then called, was created, uh, by this stage of our lives, we were due to be a 500,000 ounce gold producer uh, with less than five years of life left. You know, today our gold business alone is still producing at about 900,000 ounces, and we're forecasting to be able to sustain that for at least five years uh, out of the initial operations which, uh, which we were formed upon. Uh, we also have a, a long life with many of our assets, you know, well beyond 10 years. Uh, and I think we will we'll share with you how that positions us well relative to, to many peers in the industry. We have also created additional optionality uh, through, through some of the acquisitions we've undertaken. Burnstone is a project that has now been approved, a, a long life project that will add value to the overall gold business. That's been approved by our board and we commenced capital expenditure this year on that project. Um, and in addition, in the Southern Orange Free State, we have the De Bruyne and Bloomhook projects, uh, which as has been discussed before, the opportunity to sustain uh, the lives of the Free State operations through, through the inclusion of uranium. Uh, and these projects will certainly add a lot of option value uh, in, in, that, in, in that event. So how do we stack up against our peers? Well, you know, on a, on, on a reserve and resource and life of mine basis, you know, I think so often our, our larger assets, Clove, Trefontein, Beatrix, are perceived as being at the end of their life in decline, and that is seen negatively. Well, yes, it's quite right. They are at the end of their lives, and they are in decline. They are never going to produce what they did in their heyday. But given the size and the status of these assets, even in decline, they still compare very favorably to many of the smaller assets that are being developed today by our peers. And these assets alone, with lives extending well beyond 10 years, is highly competitive to the assets that many of our international peers are mining. And our projects that we are commencing and in our investment in DRD Gold, you know, certainly among some of the longest life assets that exist in the industry. Overall, as a company, you know, Sabanya Stillwater, when we look at ourselves as a combined precious metals producer, uh, we are in the top three of precious metals producer. You know, that gives us a substantial base to, uh, to deliver off. Um, but looking at our gold industry alone, it still remains a substantial business in terms of production. Uh, it's still within the top 13 or 14 companies. And likewise, in terms of reserve, it's still got a substantial base. Yeah, I think uh, look forward in the coming slides to the team unpacking for you a bit more details about this, uh, about this business. And as I say, why we still believe it can add significant value in the years to come to, to all of our stakeholders. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to, to Richard Cox. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Cox, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the South African Gold Operations. So our operations are located in what we call the West Vitvatesrand Sedimentary Basin. This is the greatest source of gold in the world. The basin largely extends along a long axis from the east of Johannesburg to the southwest of Valcom for more than 400 kilometers. We have six high quality, long life assets with unrivaled production history. Kloof, Drifontaine and Cook operations in the West Vits near Cartonville. Beatrix operation and South Free State opportunities in the Free State near Valcom. And Burnstone project in the South Rand Gold Field near Balfour in Pumalonga province. We also own just over 50% of DRD Gold. However, our team does not manage these operations. So all in, when we take everything into account, the gold business has a resource base of just over 80 million ounces and a declared reserve of 15 and a half million ounces. And today we will speak about much of the 15 million ounces that our team relishes in the opportunity to bring to account much more of what remains. Our workforce, including contractors, numbers 31,000 staff residing in different accommodation models very close to the operations. And clearly, given our size and impact where we operate, we are a significant economic contributor to provinces and regional economies. And we improve lives. I'd like to present the members of the South African Gold Team. Chris Barnard, our Senior Vice President for Mining Operations. William Asai, our Vice President of Technical, including Metallurgical Operations and Surface Operations. Peter Hennen, our Senior Vice President for Finance. And Tusanang Mapeng, our Senior Vice President for Human Resources. I 
I'm very proud to lead this team. This team is very experienced and up through the ranks, managing the assets at this time of their life and our lives has great appeal to us and we see new possibilities. We see new opportunities for our operations and we are excited about the adding value from our assets and today is about sharing with you how we are still able to create value. Here we have our three core producing assets, Refontaine, Kloof and Beatrix. All of them are assets that have been built over a very long time. Look at Refontaine, for example, commissioned in 1952 and production to date of over 110 million ounces. Impressive and significant. All of them underground assets with ore bodies at various depths, and access through several vertical shaft systems. The shaft systems form an interconnected matrix that is endured over time and extracted predictably the gold from the reefs. The trend has been increased levels of extraction over time or expansion and now sustaining the operations by extracting remainder reserves from much fewer shafts. This requires new skill sets and we have those skill sets. So you would be correct to observe that it is a lot to maintain with many moving parts. However, we see opportunities for value. Some of these opportunities are, for example, at Drifontaine, reconfiguring the 13 shaft operations to support D1, D4, and D5. And I must tell you that within previously thought low-grade blocks spanning 200 meters by 200 meters or 40,000 squares, Within the VCR, we are now discovering high-grade channels that can sustain opportunity-specific mining. We've had to change our readiness horizon, the speed between discovering and exploiting these opportunities from existing infrastructure. We see these channel opportunities at D1 and D5. These opportunities are not yet in plan and we look to bring them to account quite quickly from existing pre-developed infrastructure. In addition to the success at the Kloof in transitioning to secondary reefs, now I'm talking about the middle flay reef compared to the VCR, we are busy with a drop down project at K4, providing access to fresh ground between the levels 45 and 47. And at Beatrix, we also highlight the Biaser Reef Uranium deposit, and this holds possibility for life extensions beyond 2025. We own significant amounts of vacant occupation land that lends itself to solar power generation. And one such example is the 50 megawatt solar project being dusted off for eventual construction at the Kloof operations. And finally, I'd like to mention water. And so water we pump from Kloof, Drifontaine and Cook operations. Quantities are significant and in excess of 200 million liters per day. We can see a time when this water will be the next prized commodity and we hold a valuable resource. Stuart and the team have plans for value creation and they will share a little later in the presentation. So you may ask, what is it that we see? What we see are world-class assets. We see a team able to deliver promised value to stakeholders and we see opportunity. We present here our 10-year plan of production and cost Notably, the last few years have been tough with safety related stoppages weighing in in 2018, labor stoppages in 2019 and COVID-19 impacting both 19 and 20. We are happy to say that our production has normalized and we forecast a steady production profile for the next five years of approximately 1 million ounces per year. And that includes DRD gold. And I must add that a million ounces per year of production is, is a significant gold producer over the coming five years. And we look forward as well to the contribution from the Burnstone project as from 2024. We are forecasting a gradual planned decline in production when the Beatrix operation reaches the end of life in 2025. We highlight two cost trends, operating cost. And within the operating cost, this has a component of overhead. 
that we are tackling through our Project 3B, and Peter will highlight the opportunities we see a little later. And also in the all-in sustaining cost, and in contained therein is the all-reserve development costs as well as sustained business capital costs. We are seeing opportunities to reduce operating cost, and we are taking a much closer look at the overhead structure through our 3B project, and with some clever reconfigurations by the team, we can see opportunities that will deliver value. Our pre-development costs will reduce as all bodies become fully developed with reef horizon extraction being the main cost. Sustained business capital will reduce over the maintained assets as they are no longer required, but also we will spend smartly in areas of infrastructure optimization and renewable energy and receive a good return. I would also like to see the upside from the channels I was mentioning earlier in the Driffontaine area that the team are discovering within the VCR reef horizon at D1 and D5. We see in the slide the head grade and recovery percentages per operation for the next 10 years. Both Kloof and Beatrix operations head grades are largely in line with the life of mine reserve grades and also highlighted is our highest grade recovered gold from the Kloof KP2 metallurgical plant. Kloof grades will remain or benefit from increased volumes from the K4 deepening project and the timely mining of the K3 pillar from K4. We're also looking forward to rolling out the gravity concentration circuit at Beatrix, and that will improve recoveries going forward at that operation. Trifontaine's head grades increase from the eventual extraction of the large pillars protecting current shaft infrastructure. An example is the mining of the D4 pillar, which will significantly increase grade and offset lower extraction rate in the mine and lower throughput rate in the metallurgical plant. I must reiterate, as, as highlighted by Rich, is that we are extremely discerning when it comes to capital expenditure. And the focus is on cost discipline across the business. And this includes our capital expenditure profile over the next 10 years. There are significant cost and cash flow benefits from our plan reduction in capital expenditure, aligned to our, aligned to our slowing need for pre-development going forward and aligned to our reduction in operating infrastructure and associated running costs. The project capital will peak in 2022 and 2023 with a lot of work that needs to be get done in next year, for which we are preparing our readiness. So all reserve development will also peak in next year and then steady decline by 1 billion Rand by 2025. And the reason for the decline is from the slowdown at Driffontaine from 2025 and the end of life at Beatrix. Also note that the ORD also includes the Burnstone expenditure expected as from 2023 and 2024. Same business capital declines to zero at Beatrix and includes the expenditure forecast from 2023 at Burnstone. Our infrastructure optimization project expenditure driven mostly at the Kloof operations will peak in 2022 and the bulk of the work to be completed in 2024. And the Kloof deepening project schedule for completion in 2023. Burnstone growth capital also peaks in 2022 and scheduled for completion in 2026. So in summary, the capital expenditure peaking in 2022 with expenditure of just shy of 5 billion at 4.9 and reducing to 2.1 billion in 2025. This sets our business up and with significant flow through to cash flow relative to 2022. And we see that it'll have a margin enhancement expected to be approximately 60,000 Rand per kilogram by 2025. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to Itaena. Thank you, Richard, and good day, everybody. If we look at our, our performance over the last three years, it's fair to say that the business has been severely impacted by business interruptions from 2018 with the, with the safety incidents that we experienced at Kloof and Riefontein. In the latter half of 2018 and 2019, the business was severely impacted with the industrial actions on the back of wage negotiations. 
Rolling into 2020, we've had the impact of, of COVID-19. While we still had significant free cash flow in 2020 on the back of higher gold price, it's evident that the business is highly geared to the gold price, which is also evident in 2016. Richard Stewart has also highlighted that from 2014 to 2017, this business just did generate free cash flow, helping to, to the growth of the bigger business. If we look at our unit cost measures at the bottom graph, it is evident that these three years has played in heavily on, on our unit cost. Uh, as we will discuss a bit later, we've got a high fixed cost base, and as a result of those high fixed costs in the short term, when we have business interruptions, these our unit costs are inflated because we obviously divide the high cost base with the units produced within that period. If we look at 2021, which was presented a couple of weeks ago, our, our unit cost is also a bit higher on the back of uh, as a result of some safety incidents that we experienced this year, but mainly on the as a result of higher capital spent, which we will also touch on later on in, in the slides. If we look at our, our main cost drivers, 61% of our cost basket consists mainly of labor and, and electricity. These two baskets has increased 2 to 3% re respectively over the period from 2016 to 2021. While the other cost baskets, contractors, stores and others have actually reduced over the same period. If we get to mine labor and the average, and therefore looking at the average cost of an employee over this, over this five year period, this cost has increased by approximately 18% above inflation if we assume a 5% per infla annum inflation rate. When we get to electricity, our average cost, total cost basket has increased 32% over this five year period, while we actually achieved a 13% consumption reduction over the same period, working towards that zero carbon emissions going forward. On the, on the left hand corner, we talk to our total working cost, which is approximately 20 billion Rand. As is evident from 2017 to 2018, when we had to restructure the business on the closure of Cook, and even in 2019 on the back of restructuring Drifontein, it is evident that we are able to, to reduce our total cost basket when we get to restructuring the business. We will discuss a couple of the fixed variable cost ratios on the next slide. If we look at our fixed variable cost ratio, 65% of our cost base is deemed fixed in the short term. We have to discuss this fixed variable ratio with caution because this is not the real representation of the 20 billion rand as discussed the previous page. This is a representation of our current cost profile and will be will be seen as variable as we effectively have to close infrastructure or operations in the long term. This 65% of our cost base being driven by mainly labor and electricity as shared on the previous page, we unfortunately have to incur that cost when we have lower production, hence the higher unit cost production uh, that I've talked to in the earlier slides. If we start reviewing our cost per activity, we will notice that 81% of our cost base is driven by operational costs, whereas 19% of our cost base is, is driven by overheads. We've recently, as not that operational cost is not important, but we've recently started a, a project referred to as Project 3B with the objective of reducing our overhead cost bill by 5%, or from 3.8 billion to 3 billion. This overhead cost basket contains mainly of insurance, security, training, employee accommodation, and employee transport. The initiatives that we will embark on, on reducing this cost basket is by consolidating accommodation facilities, consolidating of office space. As a result of COVID, more people work from home and effectively selling more houses. We also then will optimize transport associated with, with these footprint reductions. These reductions and reviews of our cost base 
have other consequences and benefits to the to the business. Concurrent rehabilitation is enabled, and we can also obviously reduce electricity, water, and secure associated security costs that associate, that comes with these footprint. Uh, we start looking at the capital on the next slide. As highlighted by Richard Cox, our capital profile is declining over life. But it is important to, to note that our capital investment in the first in the, this year and over the next two years are a bit inflated as a result of the 2018, 2019, and 2020 business interruptions we had. We effectively had to defer some of our capital spent over these two from 2019, 2020 into 2021. If we look at all reserve development on the left hand top, our all reserve development is reducing in line with life of mine. It's actually reducing pre um, our life of mine profile as we have 24 to 35 months, 25 to 32 months of all reserves already pre developed. If we look at stay in business capital, again, elevated in 2021. But thereafter, reducing to a more stable position, but no way reducing our capital spent on, on this critical basket, as can be seen from Kluwerf being a constant uh, number over life of mine. Also driving to the higher capital expenditure in, the, in 2021 and 2022 and 23 is the investment that we're doing in optimizing, optimizing our infrastructure especially on the on the clue of operations. Chris will Barnett will share more detail around the benefits and the, the detail of the investments that we're making on on these on clue. Exciting that we've announced this at the beginning of this year, the investment and the re, and the project investment into Bernstein. Bernstein with Clue 4 dropping and deepening project is also resulting in elevated capital spend, especially in 2022 and 2023, where after it will reduce in line with the project development and, and delivering on its um, project completion. Ralph Lombard will share more detail on, on Bernstein also in a later couple of slides. Thank you. On that note, I hand over to Chris. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Wes Barnard. I'm the senior vice president responsible for the mining in the gold segment. Uh, the slide uh, that you um, uh, that you see is outlining a transverse level plan of the mining area of the Kluwer complex. Uh, shafts that can be seen on the plan is Kluwer one shaft. That's the main shaft. That is two uh, sub shafts, and then to the right of that. Uh, Clue of three shafts, which is um, outlined with a, with a rectangle of a box, the red one. And then to the far left, uh, Clue of four shaft with its sub shaft uh, infrastructure. Uh, not visible on the plan is Clue of seven and, and its sub shaft to the left of uh, Clue of four shaft. I will explain the rectangles as we discuss the content. Uh, all of which delineate or reserve, which potentially can be mined from alternative uh, infrastructure. The objective of the infrastructure optimization is a planned reduction of fixed uh, infrastructure and, and associated cost, and then also the optimization of capacity of the remaining infrastructure. This whole process already started back in 2019. Further involves development of our long life shafts extract the remaining reserves and facilitate uh, the closure of the shorter life shaft. The Kluwerf infrastructure project is primarily focused on the early orderly closure of the K3 complex. The extraction of remaining uh, Kluwerf 3 shaft reserve will therefore be facilitated from Kluwerf 1 shaft, uh, the 24 to 31 levels, uh, two larger rectangles, the blue and the green one, outlines that area uh, on the plan. And then also uh, Kluwer 4 shaft, which is uh, from 39 to 42 level. And that's a smaller rectangle at the bottom of the plan. The closure of the, the, the Kluwer 3 shaft complex will therefore result 
in a reduction in average cost and results in lowering the pie limits. In this case, uh, from above 1,700 centigrams to below 1,600 centimeter grams per ton, ensuring the economic viability of the lower grade secondary reefs, in our case, uh, the Kluwer reefs, uh, supporting higher throughput and production over the life of month. Optimization of the capacity utilization uh, of Kluwer 1 and 4 shaft, ultimately wasting capacity is, uh, is taken up and it will improve productivity at the long life uh, Kluwer 4 shaft. Additional reserves from Kluwer 3 uh, will also be mined from Kluwer 4 shaft. And as I said, that's the green, the little green uh, rectangle at the bottom of the plan. Thank you. Some key statistics in, in uh, 2021 uh, terms. The pile limit reduction, as mentioned earlier, increased uh, the crew of mineral reserves by 1.1 million ounces to 4.6 uh, million ounces by enabling economic extraction of the secondary reefs. Clue of reefs, which is sitting approximately 40 to 60 meter above the VCRs, the currently mining has been targeted at Clue of 1, Clue of uh, 7 and Clue of 8 shafts. This will result uh, in the Clue of average uh, steady state production uh, maintained at 350,000 uh, ounces per annum over the life of mine. If I look at elements of the of the Clue of uh, integration project, uh, Clue of eight shaft expansion project is designed to increase the production of the uh, shaft by 40 percent. The shaft historically mined extensively on VCR and middle fly reef uh, to a lesser extent. Now targeting and mining essentially on the Clue of reefs, which is a steep dipping secondary reef above the VCR at an average grade of about 1,200, 1,500 centimeter grams per ton. It's a single lift shaft with good infrastructure. And the current exploration development is done on three levels, which is 14, 15, and 16 level. Clue 4 to Clue 3 shaft integration designed to access uh, Clue 3 sub vertical shaft reserves from the longer life K4, uh, reduce infrastructure cost by closing down the K3 infrastructure and improve uh, uh, capacity utilization. And that is uh, purely to fill up the Clue 4 rock uh, wasting infrastructure and capability. This mining targets the remaining deep level ore reserves previously mined from Clue 3 shaft on the VCR. So, uh, as I said, that's uh, the small little rectangle on the plan. Clue 4 development reached uh, the Clue 3 boundary and is ideally positioned to mine 39, 40, uh, 41, and 42 level. I then look at Clue 1 to Clue 3 shaft integration. Uh, it's designed to access uh, Clue of 3 sub uh, vertical reserves from Clue of 1, uh, reduce infrastructure costs by uh, closing down Clue of 3, and then uh, better capacity utilization. That's to fill up the Clue of 1 uh, wasting, uh, rock wasting capacity uh, 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 and, and infrastructure. This mining targets the two larger rectangles on the Clue of uh, 1 and uh, between Clue of 1 and 3. Opening up is progressing on uh, 24 to 31 levels. Uh, in doing so, Clue of Reefs uh, between Clue of 1 and Clue of 3 is also targeted uh, to eventually mine out the remaining VCR reserves previously mined from Clue of 3. Clue of 4 to Clue of 7 shaft. This is designed to improve productivity at Clue of 4 shaft through increased phase time. Clue 4 is the deepest operation and extend its mining below the current infrastructure of Clue 7. By setting up decline infrastructure from 43 level to 40 level, many material can be transported via K7 to this mining area. This reduces traveling distances extensively and increases face time for the mining crews, uh, which will be mining in this area. All tonnage produced in this area will still be wasted at the Clue 4 uh, infrastructure. 
Grow three shaft uh, surface closure. Uh, establish a uh, refrigeration system independent of Clure 3. Cool the other Clure shafts. Once the Clure 3 sub shaft closure is affected, two of the refrigeration machines will be relocated to Clure 7 shaft. The cooling capacity uh, uh, dependency from Clure 1 uh, will then be provided from Clure 7 shaft. This will result in total closure of the Clure 3 complex. Uh, some provision made for the closure of Clue 3 surface uh, and all the integration projects uh, discussed in the slide. Clue 1, 2, 3 opening up will continue over the life of mine. And then lastly, the Clue 4 to 7 project will continue up to the end of uh, 2024. The integration project together with the drop down project will result uh, in a steady state production profile of approximately 350,000 ounces uh, per annum over the life of the, uh, the mine. The Clue 4 uh, shaft deepening project. This project extends the mining of VCR reef below infrastructure at Clue 4 to 46 and 47 level. The project involves the development of a 10 degree trackless decline related infrastructure for ventilation, uh, chairlift, and the rock handling facilities to facilitate access to the, the, the planned levels. Conventional mining is planned on these levels, and the decline has already been developed to below 46 level, and horizontal development is already uh, progressing on 46 level. Most recently, permission was been, has been obtained from the DMRE to perform full cooperations on this development and together with multi-blast conditions established will now speed up the development of the decline. Peak funding for this project is in uh, 2021 as well as in 2022 and includes refrigeration infrastructure and tractors mining equipment. The estimated capital cost to completion of the, the, the project is uh, 687 million rand over the next three years. The mining below infrastructure adds significant answers to the mining life of Cape 4, as well as to the Clough complex. Uh, steady state production will be above 150,000 ounces uh, per annum over the life of, of mine. I will now hand you over to Ralph Lombard, the Senior Vice President responsible for Bernstein Project. Thank you, Chris, for introducing me and hi, everyone. So Bernstein is a Greenfields project which will ensure a long life, shallow to intermediate depth mine. The one thing you must note about Bernstein, it has already been extensively pre-developed and this includes vertical shafts for main material, rock wasting, ventilation, a decline for access for TMA machines, a metallurgical plant and its associated infrastructure, surface workshops and, and other offices. The project will ensure a life of mine of in excess of 20 years. And it must be noted that uh, we already have 9.1 million ounces of resources available at Bernstein and also 2.2 million ounces of reserves. Bernstein is lying next to the small town of Belfort. This region has quite a lot of challenges with uh, socioeconomic issues. And it must be noted that the unemployment rate in this region is more than 30%, of which youth is standing at more or less 44%. Both the Bernstein project and mine will enhance the socio-economic stability by creating 2,500 jobs uh, in the long term, but it also will create meaningful opportunities for procurement, SMME development and skills transfer. At Bernstone, we'll be mining the Kimberley Reef at an average depth of 550 meters, going up to 1.05 kilometers by utilizing mining methods, which is well known to Sabine still water. Project capital of 2.3 billion will be spent over the next six years. This will establish a sustainable mine and the capital includes the finalization of infrastructure, the acquisition and refurbishment of TMM fleet, as well as equipment and setting up the required ore reserves. 
An additional one and a half billion pre-production capital will ensure that there's enough inventory to start commercial production by 2024. And by that stage, we will have a fully operational metallurgical plant and associated infrastructure. We expect to produce around 138,000 ounces of gold when we reach steady state with an average incremental operating cost of 419,000 rands a kilogram over the life of the mine. This will result in a net present value of 0.9 billion and an IRR of 20%. Using the commodity prices assumptions of 1,500 US dollars per ounce for gold and an exchange rate of 15. It must be noted at that spot that the NPV is more than 3 billion. Thank you. I'm handing over now to Jevin, uh, which will take you through sustainability. Thanks very much, Rob, and pleasure talking to everyone again. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to deep dive into our energy and decarbonisation strategy by SA Gold Operations. Uh, if we look at our South African gold operations, uh, as a result of their structure and depth, they are inherently uh, energy intensive, uh, accounting for 51% of our group energy requirements. As a result, they are also uh, very uh, carbon intensive. One inherent advantage that they have relative to our peers that operate open cast remote uh, gold mines is that they are largely electrified and as a result, 83% of the current uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, stem from electricity, specifically ESCOM's coal-fired power stations. 5% uh, of that is associated with the care and maintenance of the cook operations, which really just highlights the, the importance of finding a permanent closure solution to not only reduce the associated emissions, but also to re reduce the fixed costs components that Peter Henning mentioned earlier. If we look forward, we anticipate the greenhouse gas emission profile of these operations will decline in line with their production profile and as renewable energy uh, increases penetration at a national level. We, ha however, have a number of active interventions that we're currently pursuing to accelerate their decarbonisation. One of the key contributors, contributions is our advanced energy management, which not only reduces fixed cost to the business, but last year achieved 105,000 tons of CO2 uh, reduction uh, in 2020. One of the key enablers was the deployment of uh, digital twins to energy intensive infrastructure that allows the identification of both energy waste and energy efficiency opportunities. Last year, we also replaced the Beatrix uh, coal boiler with a electrode steam boiler uh, and heat pumps, which has allowed the reduction of just over 14,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. I'll shortly speak to our solar project for these operations, but these, pro these operations also enjoy the benefit of our wind strategy, where the remote wind projects will allow us to wheel uh, renewable energy to these operations. Uh, an existing flagship project is our Beatrix Methane to Power project, which currently produces nominally between one to two megawatts on a continuous basis and displaces about 20,000 tons of CO2 per annum. This is also a UN uh, clean development mechanism project that has generated just short of 290,000 tons, uh, sorry, tons of CO2 or 290,000 carbon credits to date. Uh, we're also exploring, exploring some technology opportunities to displace the remainder of our diesel on these operations, uh, including uh, on Rolf's project, uh, deploying battery electric vehicles at Burnstone. Going forward, the uh, focus will remain on electricity uh, with uh, also exploring opportunities related to future demand methane and diesel. Um, as a result of the structure of the mine, as I mentioned, largely electrified, renewable energy will be the strongest decarbonization lever we can pull. On this basis, we initiated a uh, solar photovoltaic project back in 2014 on sites adjacent to our Driefentine and Kloof operations. That project was, however, historically uh, delayed due to regulatory and ESCOM constraints. However, those have now been alleviated and we've uh, 
we've elected to reprogress these projects. Currently, the intent is to develop a 50 megawatt PV project that will directly supply the cliff operations via 132 kV overhead line. The site is in close proximity to the cliff operations and is currently permitted for up to 200 megawatts, with the majority of key consents and approvals already in hand, including the environmental authorization, the rezoning, etc. The project will be executed on a power purchase agreement basis, where a third party will be appointed to finance, build, own and operate the plant uh, on a 20 year basis and sell us the electricity through the agreement. This will afford us uh, electricity at a 30 to 50 percent discount to grid supplied electricity, escalating at CPI from day one with minimal outlay from the business. Uh, beyond Life of Mine, given that Cliff Life of Mine extends to 2034, the power will be used for the care maintenance pumping, uh, local tailings projects, and then wheeled to our other long life assets across South Africa. From an accounting perspective, the, this will be recognized as a lease liability uh, and the right of use asset. However, due to the structure of the PPA, there are new, no minimum payments due, so it's effectively represented at a value of zero. Concurrently to the final permitting processes, we, we executed an expression of interest earlier this year where we got an overwhelming response from the market in terms of willing project developers. We've now progressed this through to a request for quotation that's underway, where we intend to appoint the preferred project developer in the next two months. Uh, in the current plan, we plan to reach financial close by mid -year, next year, beginning construction shortly thereafter, and then bringing the plant into commercial operation by 2023. Um, one of the key benefits is we can potentially link these projects with some of our social projects, being the Bocamosa Barona Agri-Industrial Project in the area. Uh, and I'll hand over now to Grant Stewart, our Senior Vice President of Environmental, who can talk to this. Thanks, Jeb, uh, and good afternoon to everybody. The gold operations pump some 250 million litres of water a day and discharge 200 million litres per day thereof. The operations also purchase in some 20 million litres of water a day at a cost of 130 million rand per annum. This is in itself an opportunity to become potable water independent. We have made some significant inroads into this endeavour with our, our Cook plant and our EMC plant completely water independent of potable sources. Uh, we are well on our way with Drefontaine, who is currently approximately 90% uh, independent, and Clerf will be 33% uh, independent by the end of this year. Recognizing the pressure on, potable, on the current potable water systems, we are seeing increasing pressure on the integrated Vol River system, with RAND water imposed volume curtailment initiatives and increasing phenomenon. One less drop that we consume from the potable water system is water available to a developing town or needy community. As indicated in the ESG presentation earlier, our water conservation and water demand management drive is to ensure efficient and effective utilization of our water resources with minimum impact on the surrounding water resources and ensure availability of water resources for effective ecosystems, uh, surrounding communities and our operations. To support our eff effective and efficient uh, water utilization drive, we have a total consumptive specific water use target, which we measure in kiloliters per tonne processed. Performance against this indicator is formally measured and reported on a quarterly with monthly tracing and monitoring. Fundamental to reporting on our total consumptive specific water use target is the ability to monitor, measure and report water flows at site level. Site level accounting and, as, um, and an assessment is intended to help develop comparable and material information as the foundation for accurate and consistent external reporting. This technology also supports two critical management tools. One, our predictive water balance models to assess future water balance movements under variable climatic change imposed scenarios. And two, five-year water conservation, water demand management plans, driving initiatives to improve water management on each of our sites. Alignment with ICMM and transparent disclosure is an important part of how we operate. This is why we have recently for the first time disclosed to the water CDP. Thanks. Our gold operations in the West Rand are overlaying by dolomitic aquifers with the result that there is significant water ingress. Continued pumping of ingress water from deep workings has placed an enormous financial burden on these mines that are in some instances no longer revenue generating. 
On the other hand, it is a well-established fact that improved water supply and sanitation boost economic growth and contribute greatly to poverty eradication, something that South Africa and the West Rand desperately need. Notwithstanding economic opportunity, we have regulatory hesitancy, failing to lead the region to prosperity, hiding behind incompetence and the one environmental system inefficiency. This is not the only factor that compromises regional growth and development. Failing municipalities and their inability to maintain basic infrastructure, resulting in uncontrolled sewage discharge into our river systems and, and resulting sinkholes are illustration of further missed opportunities. Failing law enforcement, the ability, the inability rather to control the swell of illegal mining, sabotage of infrastructure and theft of cables, powering infrastructure to pump and treat acid mine drainage, yet more of our reality. I paint a grim picture, but these are not complex problems to solve when there is a willingness to make a difference and align on a common regional vision. Investing in water is a sound opportunity. Improved water resource management significantly improves productivity with economic sectors. This is certainly true for our envisaged post-closure scenario for the West Rand, where we see Bocamosa Verona, an agri-industrial socio-economic solution energized through the reliable uh, supply of water. Yes, there are green shoots. Our collaboration with Rand Water, where Rand Water have stated the need to augment their current volumes from between four to 600 million uh, liters per day by 2027, and also the draft um, um, mine closure strategy. That speaks to the heart of collaborative regional uh, closure. But who will lead this? Who's the competent authority to deal with this? That's the question. Of all the uncertainty, one thing is clear. Maintaining deep level pump stations and shaft infrastructure to continue to pump in perpetuity at huge expense and at risk to human life is not the solution. And that's not going to support economic growth and development of the region. Rewatering and the natural reestablishment of the Dolomites with access to water closer to surface has to be considered. Thanks. Let's drop down into the case study of Cook. Cook is not unique when you look at closure from a sector perspective. There are four similarities that are evident, especially as mines move to close. A decommissioned mine following a depletion of resource, contiguous interconnected mines, ingress of water, unsafe illegal mining, Comprehensive studies, both engineering and environmental support closure applications, all very similar scenarios across our mining region. Yet the authorization for closure, despite following the applicable legislation, is not forthcoming. In fact, I'm not aware of any closure certificates having been awarded in the mining environment. This can't be good for an economy begging for investment. Clearly, we need our regulators to deal decisively with the element, elephant in the room. Back to the closure of Cook, where we pump some 100 million litres of water a day at a cost of around 500 million rand per annum. Cook 4 is connected, interconnected with our own Cook 3 and our neighbouring and a neighbouring mine, who ironically commissioned the plugs between the mine and Cook 4 for the purposes of rewatering. Again, with sound engineering and environmental specialist studies in support. We ourselves have studied extensively the risks associated with the solution over the past four years and have support for rewatering from a number of corners, including conditional support from the Department of Water and Sanitation and the Federation for Sustainable Environment, whose perspective is to manage rewatering whilst the mine is still operational and can be held accountable, as opposed to a liquidation and the movement of the liability to state. We will continue to protect our stakeholders' interests and ensure learnings from Ezzelwini Mine. Uh, and those learnings are embedded into our future operations at Driefontein and Kloof and, and Beatrix as we close. We can't simply carry on with the same process and expect a different outcome. Things must change, and that requires bold action. Thanks. We must start with the end in mind. For us to achieve an agreed, safe, stable, non-polluting regional post-mining solution supporting sustainable post-mining communities and conservation areas and ecosystems, I had mentioned earlier Bocamosa Barona, and we'll elaborate on this in the, in, in the slide coming. The development of this blueprint is a critical success factor and a key outcome that gives meaning for our closure plans. All initiatives, including concurrent rehabilitation, are costed in accordance with our closure strategy and plan. The gold operations have an annual assessed closure liability of some 4.6 billion rand, of which 83% is funded. Those costs will go towards the closure of the end state. We have also significantly advanced our concurrent rehabilitation strategy aligned to our closure plans with the transaction with DRD Gold, where we elected 
um, tailings, assets, and plant infrastructure for an equity interest into DRD Gold. The transaction was key to our service is key to our service remediation strategy and environmental rehabilitation program, and more importantly, to address the impacts of tailings dust on local communities and the environment. We're also advancing our footprint reduction exercises. The processing of waste rock, the filling of pits, um, as in the middle flat pits that you, you can see on your right hand side, where we've utilized um, and, and leveraged the skills of local communities to, to fill those pits and eradicate the social ills associated with kids playing in and around, especially in hot summer rainy conditions. We've also looked at the donation of infrastructure uh, where appropriate to local communities and, and, and um, municipalities as part of our infrastructure for impact. Thanks. Wokomosa Barona means future in Tetswana. This is our blueprint of a deliberate transition from a mining economy to a post mining economy through regenerative agriculture. The BBR program, as we call it, aspires to build a globally competitive, inclusive, environmentally sustainable and diversified economy with communities on the West Rand through facilitating large scale development and socio-economic empowerment. This will be achieved through large scale agro industrial and renewable energy projects that create and sustain thousands of jobs and enabling environment for the entry of previously disadvantaged entrepreneurs into the Western District Municipality of Gauteng. The program aspiration will be achieved through the consolidation of supply of demand aggregated resources within the integration of renewable energy. The program will achieve this by establishing early stage economic development enterprises to prove the concept, followed by large scale regenerative catalytic agricultural projects with expert operators that bring skills, networks, infrastructure and supply chains with capacity to create an enabling environment for the entry of small and emerging farmers. A venture capital fund that is currently in the process of being established and capitalized will manage and host the capital used for the implementation of the program. The investment vehicle will invest in early stage catalytic operations with a long term investment horizon and high potential for good returns. The large scale nature of the BBR program will allow the Venture Capital Fund to diversify its interest across a range of operators and subsectors, producing different agricultural products, enabling it to mitigate some of the inherent risks within the agricultural industry. I'll now hand back over to Rich for the conclusion. Thank you. Uh, Grant, thank you very much. And to, to Rich Cox and the rest of the team, uh, thank, thanks very much for, for sharing that with us. Um, so if I could try and I guess just just wrap up uh, what has been said and shared with you uh, over the course of of the discussions, um, you know I think hopefully the first point that you've taken away out of these discussions is that that we still have substantial assets. We we have great assets. Uh, we have a world class management team, you know, and that together means that that we have a combination that that can continue to add value uh, for a substantial period still to come. And I think critically important these are high grade operations. Uh, and that gives us flexibility to manage them appropriately during the inherent downturns. I think we've heard a lot from, from Grant and Jevin and the team around embedding ESG uh, and some of the, the real low hanging fruit and opportunities we have uh, around the environmental uh, possibilities that, that we have. From, from my side, a significant point is, is the social side as well, uh, which these operations do, do impact on. As we know in the mining industry, uh, the dependence to each one of our employees prior to COVID was roughly 10 to 1. I dare say today that number could well be higher, which means these operations sustain the livelihoods of over 300,000 people. And when we've been faced with a tough task as we were in 2018 around the sustainability of these operations, I'm very proud to be part of the team and pleased that we've been able to turn them around, uh, get the operations back onto a stable footing and to be able to contribute significantly uh, to, to the surrounding communities and economies in which we operate. I think thirdly, operational excellence, uh, as has been highlighted, we have had a tough few years. Uh, we've had several significant operational disruptions, and it's very pleasing that despite the difficulties of operating under COVID, uh, we've now had a few quarters of, of consistent steady operation, and we are starting to see that coming through. Uh, to the benefit of the operations and being able to, to get back to a steady state position, which is critical in, in operations of this nature uh, to be able to be sustainable going forward. 
cost management is key. I think we are, are completely aware and open to the fact that, that these operations are high cost or fixed cost operations uh, in the short term, as Peter shared with you. I think we're also very open to the fact that while the team is doing some very smart things around continuously improving operations and finding areas of new ground to mine, we are not going to get significant growth out of these out of these assets in the years to come. Uh, certainly not significant growth that's going to impact on, on unit costs. Therefore, cost management becomes absolutely critical to being able to, to survive those tough times uh, and put yourself in a position to have real leverage to gold uh, during the good times. And that is an aspect that requires input and support from all stakeholders. Uh, as you have seen through the presentation, we are actively uh, addressing our footprint, looking at ways to increase the efficiencies in which we mine, addressing our overhead costs, uh, looking at new uh, aspects around ESG and power solutions, all of which contribute to reducing that cost base. Um, but to truly get the sustainable, you know, all stakeholders need to come to the party, uh, and that'll position us well uh, to leverage off this, off these assets for a period of time to come. In terms of capital allocation, uh, we have heard about the Bernstein project, and that certainly uh, is a project we believe will add, add value in the years to come, and hence the reason we're investing in that. Uh, but also very key to get the capital discipline right uh, in our core operations that, that, that remain. Uh, invest appropriately to ensure the efficiency over the remaining lives of mine, um, but also manage that capital in a responsible manner uh, that will have a positive impact on our all-in sustaining unit costs as we move towards the end of those lives, uh, as Peter shared with you. And I guess finally, uh, as, as Grant has highlighted, you know, I think Planning for responsible futures, we, we again are a company that is led in this regard. Uh, as Grant mentioned, we, we're probably one of the ones that are ahead in terms of going down the process of looking to, to close operations. Um, and what we've taken from that, there have been some learnings, there have been some school fees, and no doubt that will hold us in good stead going forward. I think a key learning, not just for ourselves, but for the industry as a whole, is that if we want sustainable closure going forward, uh, it will take the buy-in and support of all stakeholders. Uh, we have all benefited from this industry and we should all support uh, the, the responsible closure of this industry for the communities around us. I dare say and I hope that what you have been left with through our discussions though is that mine planning and closure for that planning is something we understand, it is something that technically can be done confidently, it is not something that we fear or that we see as a threat. In fact, contrary to that, I dare say closure is something we embrace as it is a true opportunity to leave our legacy. Uh, to leave communities and environments in a better way than what we found them prior to our mining, uh, which is ultimately the legacy we would like to leave. And we look forward to working with all stakeholders to deliver on that uh, to the benefit of the communities in which we operate. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I think thank you for your time today. I, uh, I truly hope that, that, that we've managed to share with you why we are passionate and excited about our gold business and believe it's still got a lot of value for the future. Uh, and we look forward to uh, sharing that same passion and excitement uh, around us PGM businesses, both in South Africa and the US in, uh, in roughly two weeks' time. Look forward to, in, to engaging with you then. Um, so, so thank you very much. And uh, on that note, you know, we will gladly, together with Rich and his team, take any questions. Uh, and I'll hand back to James to coordinate that. Thank you very much again.